Hello, everybody. If you're in the audience, I, it sounds like you can hear me. Thank you for coming. Anybody who's out there and is here for a payment processing discussion, please feel free to sit down. Um, we're going to get started. So today's session is about payment processing, one of the most important aspects of your business, which is getting paid if you're a merchant. Um, and we have three panelists here to help walk you through this topic. I have with me Alexis King. She is the Director of Partner Relations with the National Merchants Association. Um, I also have Ben Grossman next to Alexis. He is the CEO of Pinpoint Intelligence. And Adam McDonald, the President of Humboldt Merchant Services. They're going to walk you through these topics today. Humboldt and National Merchants Association are on the payment processing side of things. Um, they will um, help merchants um, obtain payment processing services. Ben's company, Pinpoint, is a, is a little bit different. They will help with chargeback management, fraud detection, and other related services for merchants in the payments industry. So lots of really great perspectives here. My name is Ellen Burge. I'm a partner in the Venable Law Firm uh, located in Washington, D.C., I do lots of work um, in the area of direct response marketing. My background is really in consumer protection types of issues and dealing with federal regulators like the Federal Trade Commission and the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. And through that work, I've ended up doing a lot of work with payment processors because of the close intersection between payments and marketing. So with that, we're going to get started. We're going to walk you through some very um, important background information about how payments work. Um, the point of this is to explain the importance of the payment system. If you're a merchant, what, do you, what should you be looking for? How does the system work? Um, why is it potentially a little bit more difficult in the direct response industry to get payment processing being a higher risk merchant type than um, a traditional brick and mortar business? Um, all these uh, other issues with pricing and um, the different types of um, services that you can look for. We'll talk to you about some of your obligations in the processing world as a merchant, some best practices that you might want to follow. We're going to go in depth a little bit more on chargeback management, fraud prevention, and uh, let you know what's on the horizon in the world of payments. So with that overview, what I'd like to do is have um, Adam start by providing an overview of the payment system, how payments flow, who are the different parties that are involved in processing a payment um, so that we can start with that understanding. Great. So I always like to start these by, if you're a merchant, raise your hand. Okay. So we have one merchant in the crowd. So this will be for you, sir. <laughs> so what, one of the big things I realize is a lot of our merchants don't really understand what is a very convoluted industry, uh, which is the acquiring industry. Uh, and I like to use our company as an example um, of one of the ma many different players in the acquiring space. So we're Humboldt Merchant Services. We're sponsored by Bank of Montreal Harris, which is the North America, or I'm sorry, the U.S. side of a joint venture between RBC and Bank of Montreal, uh, based out of Chicago, Illinois. Our bank sponsor, sometimes referred to as a bin sponsor, gives us the ability to acquire. They tell us, they dictate the credit policy. Um, and from there, they basically take a couple pennies off every transaction. From there, we're what's called a wholesale ISO. So we underwrite everything, we manage the risk on everything, we take 100% of the liability, we handle all of our customer service, our technical support, et cetera. Um, so one of the things I think that merchants don't realize is that there's a lot of moving parts. And then when you go from there, you've got some ISOs that are really just sales offices, which serve a very, very important function. Um, but the big point is to really find out who you're dealing with and what role they play in the ecosystem. Um, and I'm not gonna get too granular because we have one merchant and I think a lot of the people in the audience are sort of familiar with uh, the ecosystem of the acquiring space, so I'll stop there. But certainly if you wanna dig a little bit deeper, there's gonna be a Q&A, so feel free to, sir, raise your hand and ask any questions you have or find one of us after. So let me just say that even though we have one identified merchant, there could be others. And since we're recording this for, for future use for ERA, I think it would be helpful if we could go in a little bit more detail, Adam. All right, Thank fair you. enough. <laughs> um, so 
I'm trying to think how much more detail I can well, really give you. I, I would I would say this. What 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 do sales agents do as opposed to a wholesale so, ISO, a processor, a bank, a gateway? Okay, great great question. So everyone here is primarily a card not present merchant. So the technology that most of you guys interface with is a gateway. Um, some companies offer everything. For example, we are we have a wholly owned subsidiary called Anovio Payments, which is a gateway, which has a booth a booth here. Um, there's a lot of sales agents or what I refer to as a broker. Um, a lot of these brokers are fantastic. They bring us a lot of business. We do a lot of business with them. Um, and a lot of them can, can take you to one place and provide you with one point of contact. Um, because quite frankly, you shouldn't just have one merchant account. Um, you should have some redundancy. I think you have redundancy probably in every aspect of your business. Why wouldn't you have redundancy in the payment space? Um, is there anything else you want me to... No, I, I, th I think that covers it on sales, but, um, and this is for any of it, not to put pressure on Adam, please feel free yeah. to jump in, but I think, you know, just the, the understanding of, um, especially if you're in an, an online business, a lot of times you're working with a shopping cart provider who's got an inroad into a payment processing platform and to talk about some of those services that have um, a gateway component and linking into um, the processing side and the acquiring bank, just sort of how a payment transaction flows and, and who's doing what in that process. Is that? Sure. So, I mean, if you want to flow, talk about the flow of a card not present transaction, you have a consumer that comes to your website. Um, they interface with a shopping cart, which then interfaces with a gateway. The gateway is what passes that transaction to a, what's called a front end. They authorize it, they make sure that the funds are available. From there, there's then a back end transaction on the settlement platform, which is really what pushes the money from your card to the, or I'm sorry, your consumer's card to the merchant's bank account. Um, I think also what Ellen may be, may be touching on, and, and if not, I apologize, but let's talk about a little bit about the issuing banks, or I'm sorry, the acquiring banks. So BMO Harris dictates our credit policy. So there's a lot of sales reps out there that like to do what I call throwing darts against the wall and seeing if they'll stick. So they'll say, you're a card not present business, I can get you approved, no problem. They'll submit your application, and three days later you find out you're declined, all right? So one of the most important things a merchant can ask is about the credit policy. Because quite frankly, many, and I'd say maybe 90% of the acquirers in this country would not approve a merchant sitting in this building right now, um, just because of the nature of the liability. Um, and the banks don't like the liability, the wholesale ISOs don't like the liability, and their business is brick and mortar. Um, you know, a great example is Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo does not have a very large appetite for card not present businesses in this space. Wells Fargo probably sponsors 70% of the acquiring bins in our industry. Um, so it's very important to talk to your sales rep, talk to whoever you're speaking with about the credit policy, um, and do some diligence. Mm -hmm. So Alexis, I think this is a great segue for you because National Merchants Association has done a lot of work over the years with higher risk merchants. And really this, this industry, um, because a lot of sales are done online, they're done over the telephone, it's, it's a card not present type of transaction, <clears throat> it's, it's higher risk. And so Alexis, why don't you explain what higher risk means to the acquiring industry and why it, it sometimes can be a little bit more difficult for, for these kinds of merchants to get accounts. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, I mean, most of you know as quote unquote high risk merchants, you can't walk into your bank branch and just get a merchant account. It's a little, little more difficult than that. But we try and take the difficult part out of it. Um, and. You know, to Adam's point, when you're when you're working with a broker or an agent, it's really important that you're having that conversation with them. Where are you looking to place my business? Because there are a lot of brokers out there that will take your application as a quote unquote high risk merchant, and they will shop it around. Um, and then next thing you know, you have five different ISOs or five different banks that have now had your application, and you try and go get an application. You try and go get a merchant account yourself, and you've already been dinged with all of these different credit inquiries. So it's really important that you keep that open line of communication with whoever you're working with to get your merchant account. And it's important that you have, um, you have the sense about you to ask those questions like Adam said. What is the credit policy of this, of this processor that you're going to submit my business to? 
because there are what I like to call boutique shops. There are shops out there that specialize in your business type. So why place the business with, you know, Bank of America or First Data and these large processors and banks that don't understand your business? So that if you do have something happen with your business where let's say maybe chargebacks do spike a bit, you can contact that risk department and you can explain what happened with either your marketing or your fulfillment and they understand exactly what that means. And so they can give you uh, some sort of a grace period or they can help you with the chargeback management program so that you can move forward with your business. It's all about you know, protecting consumers as well as keeping your business healthy. So if I may add, I used to be a merchant. <clears throat> Sometimes when I say that I feel like uh, I'm in a meeting. Um, but I actually was a quite large merchant, had about 10,000 chargebacks a month. So it was a significant number, and there are processors who have told me that they don't have that on their entire book. And we were a direct marketer, all online, obviously 100% card not present, uh, and all my clients are 100% card not present. Uh, if you present me a bagel shop, I would not know how to help him with his risk. In doing that, and having been on really many sides of this entire mess that they call processing, I've learned one valuable lesson. That is, you need to understand where you're processing clearly because you're going to speak to a, a broker that's got some one company name and he's really working as, a, as an agent for an ISO that's got another company name that's really working with someone like Humboldt or NMA. And it could be like three or four levels down with the guy that you're actually speaking to. Then what he does is, like Alexis mentioned, He's placing that at every single bank that he can possibly think of. And when you start working with two brokers, you've got two brokers doing the exact same thing. So the one thing I tell all my clients is make sure you're working with one. If you're working with two, you need to be upfront and honest with them and let them know who you're working with and which bank they're going to and make sure that there's no overlap. The second thing that I'll add to that is communication with your processor is really important. If you're only doing fifty, sixty thousand dollars a month on a mid, then it, it becomes less of a uh, a pain point. There's less risk to the to the processor. But once you start becoming a larger client and you start doing a significant number of transactions, getting to know your processor, going out to dinner with them, speaking to them, letting them understand your policies and your procedures that you're using in order to prevent fraud, is extremely helpful. Lastly. When things go wrong, you'll be able to reach out to them, talk to them, and see if there's other ways that they can help you get through the difficult time. Just because someone breaches doesn't mean the world ends. But if you breach and there's not a predefined plan of how that's gonna happen, or what's gonna happen when that, when, when, when that breach happens, that's when the world ends. A lot of times processors, you know, depending on the situation, obviously, and every situation is different, will allow a little bit of leniency if they can, and that's, again, back to what Adam said, based on their, on their bank and their credit policies, uh, and try to get you back in the program and off the visa radar. And that, that's the goal with the processing. Everybody knows, especially when the holidays are coming up, January, February, and March are the times that most merchants have the biggest issues. So we want to try to get ahead of that and be ready for that and understand both where we're going and who we're working with. So can I, can I give a quick example that I think will wrap this up nicely? And by, by no means do I want this panel to turn into a scare, you know, like a, you know, be like a, a scary thing about payment processing. But we recently started doing business with what we'll call a major merchant, a merchant doing millions of dollars a month. They had been processing for years with Chase. Okay, Chase, I'd say the majority of their portfolio is with brick and mortar retail businesses. Um, they had a hiccup with their fulfillment, um, something that Alexis touched on. And their chargeback spike. You know, let's say they had, you know, maybe 20 basis points or 0.2% chargeback ratio for the last six years. Well, all of a sudden, their chargeback ratio spiked to 1.7%, which put them in the Visa and MasterCard chargeback management program. So this merchant calls Chase, and they're talking to a $12 an hour customer service rep, and then they're transferred to a $14 an hour risk manager. And neither of these people know what a fulfillment house is. Neither of these people understand your ecosystem, your business, what you guys do. Um, we do. Boutique, you know, boutique shops like Humboldt, like NMA, like a lot of the people here, they do. A lot of the agents here that aren't wholesale ISOs understand that and can help you navigate. Um, so I think it's a great example of why 
you want to really look into the book of business that you acquire, you know, processes. We don't board restaurants and dry cleaners. We board merchants like yourself. We understand your business. And I think it's more important than ever for merchants with everything that's going on with the associations, the regulators, to really be aware of what their acquirer does and specializes in. So let me move on to a related topic. What, what types of things can a merchant negotiate on when they finally do have a payment processing relationship with an acquiring bank? Um, pricing terms, for example. I think one of you should explain pricing terms um, and where the fees come from. And you know, when I s- search for pr- um, payment processing pricing on the internet, I see lowest prices guaranteed, marketing claims made by the processors. But if you're in this industry, should you expect to get the same rates that a restaurant or a shoe store is going to get? Or um, does this industry um, pay a little bit higher rates? And one of those rates cover? Is it increased underwriting? Those types of issues. Right. I can take that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, absolutely. You're, you know, you're not going to shop on the internet and get a merchant account from a lowest, lowest prices guaranteed website. That's just not the type of business that you're in. And quite frankly, you wouldn't want one of those processors managing your merchant account. So there will be a a little bit of a higher cost there, but that does. That pays for you know hands-on with your merchant account, looking at the risk every single day, monitoring your transactions, letting you know if there's oh you know hey we see quite a few declines. We're going to reach out to you, Mr. Merchant, and let you know these declines have spiked. Maybe you don't even know that, right? Maybe we've caught something for you. So yes, that does come with a cost, but ultimately, I mean you know you get what you pay for, and it's it's a specialized merchant account that you would be getting. So. Can I build on that a little bit? So I think taking a step back, the biggest cost that goes into payment processing doesn't go to myself, it doesn't go to Alexis. It goes to Visa and MasterCard in what is interchange. Every single acquirer in this country pays interchange. I don't care if you're Chase, I don't care if you're Bank of America, I don't care if you're NMA, I don't care if you're Vaniv, everyone pays the exact same price. It's public knowledge, you can Google it, Visa interchange costs, MasterCard interchange costs, that is probably 80 to 90% of the cost that you pay. And it, just one quick thing, is interchange a percentage of the sales transaction? Interchange is both a percentage and then what they call a per item or you'd refer to as a transaction fee. So you could have a signature, inter, you know, a signature visa interchange rate of 1.7% and five cents a transaction. Everyone's paying it, okay? So on top of that, how do we price? Well, we use a risk-based pricing model. Right? The, you know, the higher the risk, the more we're going to need to take on. Right? We may need to add a reserve to that. Um, so if you're running at an 80 basis point or 0.8% chargeback ratio month in, month out, you're likely going to pay a higher price than a merchant that's running at a 0.2% chargeback ratio month in, month out. Now, another thing I can say that we're very good at is we are a relationship-based company. Um, And I mean that. Sometimes you call customer service and talk to my vice president of operations. I mean, we are that small of a shop to the extent of what we, you know, type of merchant we deal with. So relationships mean everything, right? So if you're you're doing business with us for 12 months, 24 months, and you're showing a consistent ratio, right? Even if it's at 0.8%, there's always going to be wiggle room in the price um, just because you've proven it to us. Now, if you come to us, right, and you show us that you've got spikes here and there and you don't have a consistent ratio, that's going to be concerning to any underwriter. Um, and you're likely going to pay a higher rate for that. So sometimes I hear merchants ask me, should I consider taking my processing offshore? Should I use an international processor for my payments? Will I have an easier time getting an account? Will I go through less underwriting? Will I pay less fees? Are there different... Um, and higher chargeback thresholds. Would one of you mind talking a little bit about any differences and any benefits or not benefits to, to going internationally or why we should stay domestically? Sure, so I, I could take that a little bit. Um, if you go offshore, you're actually gonna be paying more than if you're processing domestically. If you go offshore, generally you'll have to wait longer for your money. Most offshore processors are gonna put you on either a seven day uh, in arrears payments or 14 days in arrears payments. Um, their rate is gonna be sometimes significantly higher. We see rates seven, eight, 10% from some of our clients uh, for processing offshore. The advantages of going offshore are starting to dry up as well, is that Visa's moving their rules from 2% to 1%. So 
So that's going to affect the, the big advantage of being offshore, which when I was a merchant, we absolutely used that advantage. The way we were able to keep our chargebacks in, uh, in check is we knew which transactions were higher risk and lower risk. So we would balance our book. We put the lower risk transactions domestically and the higher risk ones internationally in order to take advantage of that 2% chargeback threshold. That's going away. Um, the, the other advantage, obviously, of international is that you're dealing with uh, a different set of rules, so to speak. I think Ellen could probably talk more about how those rules would work in that you are not a U.S. company when you are processing offshore, but you are doing business in the United States. So it really would be more like a legal question for you, Ellen, is does it give you any sort of legal protection to be offshore? Yeah, and the answer to that, as you would guess, is no, it does not. Because, of course, in the United States, um, our laws are there to protect our consumers. Our consumer protection laws protect our consumers. Um, if a regulator was interested in a merchant for whatever they were doing, and, and regulators often do deep uh, dig deeper into your business than just what's on the surface. They dig beyond the marketing and they start looking at your lead generators on the front end. They'll look at your fulfillment and your payment processing on the back end. They will be very interested to know um, what you're processing offshore and who you're working with, but it won't matter to them at the end of the day because they're still going to be very much interested in, in complaints that are, get reflected in chargebacks and refunds and other types of things. So that's the answer. Right. There really shouldn't not be any reason to go offshore if you're running a good solid business and you find yourself with a processor such as NMA or Humboldt that knows your business, there really should not be any reason to go offshore, um, put yourself at that risk. You know, back in the day, it was the wild, wild west offshore and people were running high chargeback ratios. Those days are gone, as Ben explained. Um, you know, consumers still place chargebacks on the, on the offshore accounts. So um, the offshore banks now are, are hip to the chargeback jive and they're, they're, just, they're just as tough, if not more so than uh, some of our U.S. banks. The other thing is you don't have the law on your side when you have to go get your reserves. So if you're processing, a lot of people want to go process in China now. Um, there are some options out there, but a lot of our clients have had their reserves just taken from them. Basically, when they saw the number was big enough in reserves, they decided, well, it's time to shut down your account. Why? Well, we like the money that, and there's nothing you can do because we're in China. So we see that happen over and over again, not just China, in lots of different countries uh, in Eastern Europe and, and other places. So, and you have no recourse. There's nothing you can do. You, you know, Ellen's a great lawyer, um, and she cannot go to China and get your money back because there's just... Uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a different world out there. So that's what you need to keep in mind also when going offshore is where are you processing? There's some really great banks that are offshore. Um, you know, UK has a great bunch. In, in Europe, you can find really respectful banks that would be the equivalent of U.S. banks. But then there's all these other shady, scary banks with like seven or eight people working them. And they're just keeping your reserves and telling you you can process. And you won't necessarily see any or very little of that money. So I, I just want to add up something it's still payment related, but not as, as sort of scary or negative, but you also have to look at, at the business reason. Um, you know, for example, if you go to a bank in the UK to process transactions coming from US consumers, you're going to have a degradation in your conversion ratio. And what I mean is that you're probably gonna have 80% of your cards actually go through or be accepted, because if you've got an issuing bank in, um, if you've got an issuing bank in Texas, but you're putting that transaction through a bank in the UK, that issuing bank in Texas may say, flag it and decline it. So you kind of want to have a lake for lake scenario. So you want to put your US cardholder transactions through a US acquirer. Um, I do think there's some reasons to go offshore. Some of the reasons are you want to take your business and expand it globally. Our gateway connects to 34 different banks in every acquiring region in the world. If you want to expand into South Africa, right, you're going to want to offer that consumer South African rand. So you want to make sure that you've got the ability to do currency conversion. Um, we deal with a great bank in Germany that does that for us. Um, we deal with some U.S. banks that do it for you if, you're, if you don't want to go offshore. So there are some actual business reasons for going international. Um, and what we see a lot of our merchants are looking to expand. Um, they've really nailed down the U.S. market and they're seeing some of their competitors going to Australia, going to South Africa, going to Europe. Um, so, you know, and, and we're all about growing revenue and bottom line. So if you're looking to take your business international, there are some really great banks out there 
and you would want to consider working with them. Can I just do one second of translation for all of you merchants out there that don't know the difference between an acquirer and an issuer? An issuer is the credit card that you have in your pocket. The acquirer is the bank that is going to accept the number, so to speak, off the credit card in your pocket, put it through the system, and allow the merchant to be paid. So I think that a lot of merchants uh, out there don't know that or don't understand the terms that we're using. So I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page in the terms. What Adam was mentioning was you can have, you know, domestically you're seeing about 98% of the cards that are issued are going to go through your merchant account and be recognized as a bank that has a deal with your acquirer, the one that's allowing the payment to be accepted. Offshore, that number can go down. I had an account that was about 60%. Uh, were accepted. That means 40% of the very perfectly good transactions that I would have taken were automatically rejected only because they did not have an agreement with the bank here in the United States that had given out the credit card. So you do they get that degradation. However, when that same account was used for UK traffic, that number was about 95% of the UK cards. Reason being that that's what it was set up to do. The banks did not set up UK processing to process in the United States originally. It was set up for their home countries. So that's what Adam is talking about where you could have the degradation and that's one excellent reason to go offshore when you're trying to pursue those new uh, markets. Okay, I want to shift topics a little bit. Everything we've talked about till now has really been about the relationship between the merchant and the acquiring side of the payment system, your processor, your, the acquiring <coughs> bank. And that's all behind the scenes to the consumer customer of the merchant. But there is a, there's, a, there's a huge payments component to the relationship between the merchant and the customer more directly. Um, and there are some very basic requirements that Visa and MasterCard put out for how a merchant should conduct its business. There are other requirements that you might have your processor or your ISO tell you about refund policies and cancellation policies and having those clearly posted. Um, so we're, from, a, from a payments perspective, from a payment processor type of perspective, um, there are often some best practices in the industry for merchants that are passed along and um, I think we should talk about some of those because it all does become, it's a big part of what does the customer recognize about the charge and this will lead us in a little bit into a, a bigger discussion on chargebacks but things like billing descriptors and putting phone numbers on bills and things like that. If, if one of you wouldn't mind maybe talking about some of the best practices that you would recommend. Yeah, I can start out and then I'm sure you guys can add. Um, of course, it's all about consumer experience. So you want to make sure, as Ellen stated, that your billing descriptor matches what your actual product is. Um, making sure that the phone number is easily read on every single page, every every website that you have. Um, making sure that you're working, if you're not doing in-house customer service, it's really important that you're working with a reputable customer service management company, that the hold times are not long, that the customer experience is not frustrating. Um, put yourself in the customer's shoes, right? If they call to get a refund and they have to wait 15 minutes on the phone, they're not going to just keep waiting another two minutes so someone can answer the phone. They're going to call their bank. Um, you know, it's... We all know that, yes, there is friendly fraud out there and that there are consumers that, that have taken advantage of the system, but let's try and cut down on as many of those as we can by providing a good, a good all-around experience for them. Um, shipping times, you know, that's a huge thing. You want to make sure that you're working with a fulfillment center that doesn't have the long shipping times. Amazon Prime has spoiled consumers, so they're looking for their product right away. Um, you know, there are plenty of great fulfillment centers out there that have multiple locations. So if, they ha if you have West Coast consumers, they can ship out of their West Coast location. So um, it's working with great partners and, and making sure that the consumer has a great experience. Some of the things are very obvious. Um, Alexis talked about your billing descriptor. For those of you that don't know what that is, that's what shows up on your credit card bill. Putting the correct phone number that actually works and checking that it actually works we find that all the time they're putting the wrong phone number. Uh, there was a typo, there was a misprint, they turned off that phone six years ago, and there's a huge way to avoid chargebacks because they're able to then contact your customer service team. One thing that I always tell everyone is if that phone number should be unique to that merchant account. So A, you know where the phone uh, call is coming from, and B, any phone numbers on your billing descriptor should jump the queue. They're not calling to find out why their product didn't work. They're not trying to figure out how to open the package. They're calling because they're upset about the billing. They just got your phone number 
off their credit card statement. So obviously, if you take that call first, you're going to be able to reduce your chargeback and your refund ratio and be able to deal with that customer directly. Another very, very obvious one is let the consumers know what they're buying. Um, we all do a good job of that, and there's always the fine line between conversions and openness to what they're actually purchasing. And it's a very difficult line to, uh, to manage. Obviously, you have the legal aspect where, you know, Ellen and, and others like her can help you from a compliance point of view. And then there's the sales aspect where we want to make sure we keep our conversions up there as high as possible. But then there's that going overboard where we see that there's merchants that don't publish the price at all on their checkout page and then they wonder why their chargeback ratios are 12 or 14%. And it's very simple that they didn't actually know what they're buying. So taking those steps, you might think you're making more money now, but in reality what you're doing is you're just causing yourself a uh, short-term gain for a long-term problem. Um, the other thing that we do as a company is we focus on where the traffic is coming from, where the purchases are being made, and evaluating each and every transaction based on a giant database of transactions to determine if the person on the other end is who they say they are. So just like the processors around me want to make sure that you are who you say you are before they're going to give you the ability to take credit cards, every time you ship out a product, you're shipping out a risk. You're paying for the traffic, first of all. Many of you pay either a CPA or a CPM in order to get that traffic. Once you ship out that product, you've paid your fulfillment house to send it, you paid your manufacturer to produce it, you paid for your people to deal with that transaction, and then when it turns into a chargeback, you're not only paying the chargeback fee, but you still have had to pay all those people, and you need to drive more traffic in order to, you know, at least another extra 100 transactions to get rid of that one bad transaction. So one thing that we really encourage is know your consumer, and there's a lot of ways to do it, um, we, you know, our, we, we do it on the front end and then also on the back end. So we do a review process after the purchase is made based on, on the scores that we, that we produce. And there's, there's other services out there similar to mine, and all of them have their bells and whistles and, and pluses and minuses, but knowing your consumer is a huge part of making sure that you're not just asking for problems and tracking who's sending you that traffic. They may be your best friend. You might go out and they may party hard with you here in Vegas. But very often, those are the guys that are sending you the worst and most garbage traffic. Can anyone guess how much a credit card costs online to buy? Anyone? If you had to guess, if it would be $5, would you say that would be a little or a lot? A little. What if I told you it was 50 cents to buy a credit card? And not just the credit card number, you're getting the name, the whole name, the address, the CVV code, the little three digits in the back or four digits on the front of the Amex card, and the complete zip code, so all of your AVS checks that you're doing in all your gateways are gonna go right through because they already have the address, the billing address on file. So with that scary information, how many of you pay more than 50 cents as a CPA when someone buys? So I used to pay $99 or $69. So I'm out that money. So if I got a guy who bought 10 cards, cost him a whole total of, you know, $5, and he runs five transactions a day at $100 CPA, he's making $500 minus uh, his little bit of money. So it's a great business to be a thief. What you need to do on your side is to try to prevent those thieves from coming and do your best practices all around to make sure you know your consumer. And what we've seen is a drastic reduction in chargebacks simply by taking the time and effort to know your consumer. And here's the great part that all of you are gonna love. Your traffic source is gonna get angry because your conversion ratio is gonna go down. And you're saying, oh my gosh, my conversion ratio is gonna go down, they're gonna send the traffic to my competitor. What if I told you that if you would cut out all of your bad traffic, or at least most of it, because you'll still have chargebacks, you wanna stay in business, there's gonna be chargebacks. You can pay more than your competitor because you're not paying on the bad traffic. And you're gonna be paying less to Alexis and Adam for your processing because your chargeback ratio is gonna be lower. So if you think of that cost savings, um, the cost of the, the, the manpower as well as the technology to know your consumer a little bit more is number one on my best practice list. It's the number one thing that allowed me to process uh, five to 25 million a month with 
10,000 charge racks, staying under 85 basis points domestically and 185 basis points internationally for four years. And actually my partner, Nico, who you can meet, was the man that managed that whole process uh, for our company. So we can tell you from the nitty gritty, we built it all from the bottom, and it was about knowing our consumer. And until we did that, we were continually having breach problems, we couldn't keep our charge racks down, and we were paying a lot of extra money for CPA that we had no reason to pay for. Can I, I just also want to add one quick thing. So Visa, in the most recent update, so Visa and MasterCard update their guidelines generally twice a year, they update Interchange twice a year. In their most recent update, um, Visa had added what I'll call a catch-all to their definition of a high-risk merchant. So historically, it would be based off of merchant category code. Um, and you know, a gambling merchant, a gaming merchant, a high-risk merchant category code. What they recently added is some language that basically said, and any other merchant that violates our card brand standards. And so one of those violations, and one of the, one of the things we see most is deceptive marketing. Um, so I urge you to talk to your attorneys, have them review your checkout pages, make sure they're compliant via the FTC, make sure they're compliant via the card brands, because let's say you have that spike and you hit, you may, be, you, you may become a high-risk merchant in the view of Visa and MasterCard, even though your MCC doesn't, di um, doesn't dictate that. So it's something very, very important to know, and it's a recent change. Can, can I just, one second on that? Um, when you're talking about attorneys, there's a million attorneys out there. There are very few attorneys that really understand our space. And it's really important, there's, very, there's a couple of firms out there, and they specialize in that, and when you're picking an attorney, you wanna make sure you're not going to the same guy that did your closing, because he is not gonna know what he's talking about. You need to go to someone who has been through the ringer, has had that experience both with the governing bodies uh, that be here in the United States, as well as had the experience of how the merchants, you as merchants, look at conversion ratios. Because until they understand that entire process and that entire picture, they can't advise you appropriately. And I can assure you the guy that did your trust or estate is gonna freak out when he looks at what you're doing on your checkout pages. Uh, when you work with a firm that's been doing that a lot, and, there, and, and like I said, there's a, a bunch of great firms out there, um, they, they understand what you're doing and they've seen hundreds and hundreds of checkout pages. So it's not like they're gonna be shocked that you're you know, only at 14 point font on your pricing. They're gonna understand why you're doing that and why your colors are the way they are and why you're collecting the data on one side rather than the other side and all the other details that go into creating the best performing landing page. Um, and, and that's super, super important and you should keep that in mind when, when deciding uh, how to do it. And it really saves a lot of money and I can speak from experience on the wrong end of the experience um, to have an attorney review all those pages before you start using them rather than after uh, certain people come and ask questions about why they look the way they do. Yeah, and just to close that out, you know, it's really important. I mean, you, the first thing that you did right was come here to ERA. Um, you know, get with your trade association, get with, you know, the people that are there on Capitol Hill lobbying for you and for your industry, because you want to, like Ben said, get ahead of it. You don't want to wait until someone comes knocking on your door. They're here to educate you. They're here to let you know what you need to do for your business and also to protect consumers. So it's huge. Yeah. And, and I will, let me just add one thing to that. And that is a great thing about ERA because while it is traditionally focused on the merchant group, there is a, a really large emphasis right now on the payment side of it. And that is because, and I can tell you this too, just from somebody who, who advises both merchants and payment processors, giving the advice on what are the current standards for a negative option marketing program, a free trial offer, a continuity billing program. It's the same advice that we give to merchants that we are now giving to payment processors because the processors are asking us, what do we need to look out for in the underwriting? And, and it, they're not trying to be difficult. It's just that um, in the current ecosystem of government regulation, the payment processors are being held responsible if they give a merchant account to somebody who is not doing it right. Um, it's more than financial risk of loss for them now. It is potentially changes to their business practices and all other sorts of pain. So um, it is... Um, that is one of the reasons why we talk about this issue together, why we bring payments in to talk about the merchants, why ERA is, is, is doing that very strongly now and um, really becoming a resource for the mer merchant community and the, and the payment providers in that space. So, 
Okay, so let's move on to chargeback management. This is chargebacks is such a huge issue. I mean, for the longest time, um, when I first started working with the Federal Trade Commission on payments issues, chargeback chargebacks were the key benchmark to perhaps indicating that there was a um, a fraud problem or unauthorized charges or terms and conditions were not clear enough, and and that may still be the case for many merchants, but there are lots and lots of other reasons for chargebacks, and some of that may have to do with the EMV shift that um, Alexis can talk about very briefly, or, or other reasons why chargebacks come in. Friendly fraud is, is something we have we sometimes hear a lot about. So um, I want to start by just um, getting a sense of what are the current thresholds for chargebacks. It's basic, but let's start there. Um, what, what puts you in a chargeback monitoring program? Are processors looking at you at lower thresholds, perhaps, rather than hitting the 1%? Are you going to hit a flag, at least internally, if you hit, for example, 75 basis points? Um, is there a normal level of chargebacks for any one merchant? Um, and let's get into that discussion for a little bit. So anybody want to start? Let's just define a chargeback, just because, again, I want to make sure that everyone's on the same page. They pick up that card that they use to pay. They call the back of the card. They're calling Chase, Citibank, whatever card they, they've used. They're complaining. Some guy for $8 an hour is deciding why they're complaining. And then they're sending you a mail or email letting you know, or maybe the portal, depending on the process you're using, to let you know that a consumer is disputing whether or not this was an appropriate charged charge. Um, on that, there are rules based on Visa and MasterCard's uh, Bible. Visa's Bible is what, about 1,600 pages? Um, letting you know how many you can have per the number of transactions. Fraudulent ones are different than non-fraudulent ones. So that's the definition of a chargeback. The reasons they're happening, I think the best thing is to start with Alexis to talk about the EMV shift, which is something I, I know we're all part of uh, ETA as well, the Electronic Transaction Association, and it's been a very big topic over there over the last year and a half. So if you can give us a little more definition of what it is. Right, so the EMV shift, everybody knows that you have the new cards with the chip in it and now it takes forever to check out because you have to stick it in the thing and it beeps at you to take it out. That's what EMV is. Uh, you know, just as everyone speculated, just as it happened in Europe, we knew that once the EMV cards started coming out that the fraud was going to shift to e-commerce and card not present. Because they cannot counterfeit an EMV card, they have moved to the card not present uh, world. So we have seen a spike in chargebacks. We were prepared for it. Everybody knew it was going to happen. But most of the merchants that we work with in the negative option and the continuity uh, have not been as affected by the actual fraudsters because they're not going to go to a website for a $4.95 free trial shipping and handling payment and run you know, stolen cards through there. They're going to buy high ticket items that they can sell for cash later. How we have been affected though is that because of the spike on the e-commerce side, the issuing banks have been flooded with chargebacks and which with disputes. So they are unfortunately quicker to respond to let's say someone calling in on their 495 trial asking for a chargeback because they have so many now because of the EMV shift um, it has taken taken a toll on them. So we have seen a spike um, it's not affecting our merchants as much but it is it is still there. We, we saw 30, a 37% spike about four months ago uh, we're seeing that trend continue to, rate, to rise up um, as more and more cards are becoming EMV compatible and more and more merchants, brick and mortar merchants are getting their uh, terminals changed. So as you'll see, you're, you're going to start seeing, and I'm sure you've noticed already, uh, when you checked into the hotel, they started doing it. When you, uh, when you go into the gas stations, you're going to start seeing it about a year and a half. But every other place along the way, you're going to start seeing that the EMV, and as long as they can't steal, they're thieves. Thieves want to keep stealing because it's a good business, and they're buying the cards for 50 cents. Um, they're going to continue to go online where it's much easier to get a fake credit card through. Uh, Adam, have you seen a big spike as well? Yeah, I mean, we've definitely seen the trend. Um, the shift is absolutely affecting card not present merchants. Um, it's more important than ever to make sure that your gateway um, you know, is utilizing chargeback mitigation tools. Um, you know, our gateway, for example, has three different um, fraud scoring tools built in um, that are just normal course, part of your normal service. In authorized.net, for example, a NMI, for example, 
these gateways do not have that functionality. Um, you know, our gateway can also provide you with some automated um, tools regarding mitigation with Verify and Ethica, some of those services. So you've really got to take a look at the technology you're using in the card not present space because um, the fraud shift is real. So let me make uh, another point about chargebacks. I, I think there are a lot of chargebacks c that can be attributed to fraud in, in an increasing number, and that's a problem for our overall ratios. Uh, it also can be very tempting for some companies, if, especially if they're new startup, they're in a recurring bi billing model, and they're trying to survive perhaps on a continuity-based billing program and dealing with the regular course of chargebacks that they would normally see, um, to, to, um, to employ various tools to balance out their chargebacks, find ways to get a higher volume or higher number of sales transactions to balance out lower chargebacks. So we've seen merchants do things like split transactions in the sales as one charge or in the shipping and handling and processing as separate charges, maybe load balancing. I know that we can talk about good and, and bad reasons to load balance, but um, ways that you are trying to split out your sales to artificially reduce your chargebacks. These are all things that the government regulators are very much watching, and they're looking for this with merchants. They're looking for um, instances where you, if you're on a recurring billing pro program, you might put your charge in a couple days early or a couple days late because it's going to give you more or less charges one month or another. So um, I, I don't know if any of you want to address that. It's more of a point, but I think there's good, good, and, good and not so great tools for, for managing chargebacks. I, I mean, I'll let Ben talk about that because it's his business. Um. So yeah, so we we try to look at the entire picture of chargebacks. Obviously, like we discussed before, knowing your consumer is number one. So we're always looking at the front end of that transaction to determine whether or not there's a charge you want to take. And we created a massive database of consumers. Um, almost every consumer in the United States is in our database at this point, as well as most of Europe. Um, and, and that's from just collecting data, not just from our own clients, but through a shared data pool. What that has done is uh, let us uh, create a persona of that um, person that's actually on the other side and making sure it makes sense that this person should be making that transaction. Um, the next part is obviously uh, we're a reseller of a company called Verify and a company called Ethica. Uh, excellent companies. What they do is they work directly with the issuing bank and they're able to stop the chargeback before it happens and allow you to make a refund. So what, we have a, a portal where all the information goes in and you're able to manage that. The next step in that process is also to fight the chargebacks that do come in because we want to try to recover as much money as we legitimately can for the chargebacks that you're getting. Um, and the win ratio is obviously based on the individual business that you're doing, what you're shipping, if you're shipping, how you're shipping. Um, but the, the point in that is to try to recover some of the loss. Obviously, it's not recovering your chargeback fee. Obviously, it's, uh, it's not necessarily recovering your other costs involved, but it's trying to bring some of that money back. But the biggest thing is to not think that one tool is going to solve your chargeback problem. It has to come from using best practices, disclosing on your pages what you're doing as best as you possibly can, uh, keeping conversions in mind and, and keeping the legal stuff in mind as well as well as using all the tools that, that you possibly can to try to mitigate the charge racks. So I, I, I want to take a quick step back because I think there's one, there's one trend we are seeing that is extraordinarily dangerous for card not present merchants. So one of the things Alexis mentioned is you're not seeing a lot of these fraudsters taking the stolen credit card data and going to lower ticket merchants. That, that's actually not quite true. So if you go in and buy, you know, these guys aren't buying five cards, right? These guys are buying 5,000 card numbers, right? They're buying huge tranches of card numbers. Well, once they get the card numbers, they need to verify what card numbers actually work and what card numbers don't work. And a lot of times you see them, them test on the free ticket, or, or I'm sorry, lower average ticket, free trial merchants, because they'll have a system that'll push 5,000 card or transactions through your gateway at one time. If your gateway doesn't have something in place to prevent what's that's called a velocity attack, um, you've got to get with a gateway that does because we're seeing it more and more and more. So.
for example, our gateway can identify an IP address, right? So if it sees that there's more than 10 transactions coming from the same IP address, it's just going to block all of those transactions from that IP address. We can also do geolocating. So if we see fraud countries like, for example, um, you know, there's some countries in Eastern Europe, there's some countries in Africa where you're seeing a tremendous amount of fraud come out of, um, you know, we can actually geolocate to stop transactions coming from that geographic area. So I think what you're gonna start seeing, especially in this industry, you know, with higher chargeback merchants, is you're gonna see a lot of those fraudsters use your websites to determine what cards are actually legit and what cards have been closed. Um, and it's gonna be a huge problem and we're already starting to see an uptick. So I had a, uh, a friend of mine from a charity call me up. He was very excited. He had his biggest single fundraising day ever by a factor of like tens of thousands of dollars than he ever did even when he had his dinner. The next day, the bank called him up and told him that all the charges were fraudulent. And one guy had realized that he's just some little charity located in Queens, New York that probably gets four or five transactions a week at best and, uh, and they realize that he has no protection. So even those merchants are, are, are being victimized. Um, one of my really great clients only sells products that are between $20 and $40. His highest ticket is $40. His chargeback ratio is continuing to increase at almost 85 basis points because they realize that they can just get this free stuff, it's cheap, and they can move it quick on eBay or other places. And obviously using a lot of the tools that Adam was talking about, our, we don't have a gateway. Um, our, our system works in front of the gateway, but we're, we're identifying things like the IP address. We're blocking IP addresses all day long, every day. Uh, computer devices, we, we actually put a fingerprint on every device and take a fingerprint because they're not, you know, they may be sophisticated, but they're not changing their device every two minutes to use all these cards. That becomes impractical. And there are guys that are not checking IP addresses like Adam was talking about. There are guys that are not checking the, 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 the geolocation or the, uh, the device ID. We even have a list of higher risk zip codes in the United States. Do um, you know that New York City, obviously, is one of the highest risk zip codes in the United States? But upstate New York is one of the lowest risk zip codes in the United States. California, very high. Uh, Minnesota, very low. So you're able to take that into effect. And, and though you may have to exclude certain transactions, in the old days, you used, to, you used to say, well, let's just exclude all of California. That's not practical. It's too many people. But maybe I can exclude one or two zip codes in California. And, and, and I can bring down my chargeback ratios because that's where I'm seeing that the fraud is happening. So all these different tools uh, are critical. Um, we're, are, we're looking at about 300 data points in about 300 milliseconds when we're making a real-time decision on whether you should accept or deny the transaction. Um, the, the other aspect of that is like Adam was talking about, you're turning on the NMI or the, or the authorized.net fraud tools, they're worthless. Uh, it's a total waste of your money. Um, you might as well turn them off, you'll save yourself money on that. But what we found is there, there's other tools out there uh, that are looking at the right data points. It's not about having data, it's about looking at the right data, right? And so we want to make sure that you're looking at the right data when making that decision and knowing why you're saying yes or why you're saying no to any given transaction. Okay, so we are almost out of time. We can bring a microphone down. Does anybody want to ask a question? Okay. Hold, can I have a microphone? And you, you, oh, oh, you have, okay, great. How's it going? Good. Uh, we're, we sell a, a, probably a medium price product, average order value, $500, and we're about to go on TV first quarter, and we've been advised to take, you know, set up a payment plan, so some kind of internal payment plan where we hold the paper. Uh, I don't know if I missed this at the beginning of the talk, is there any guidance or any thoughts on how, we should vet, I mean, we know our, our customers are senior customers, it's a hearing aid product, very little fraud, very few chargebacks, but you know, our concern is if this is a really successful product, we're gonna hold a lot of paper and if the last payments are either you know, bounce back or, or charge back, we got a problem. Is there any tools or, or things that we could? Well, obviously knowing your consumer is gonna be helpful. Um, you also probably wanna, on, on a marketing side, Work to make sure they know they're getting billed, try to do some kind of follow-up, and then when the charge is not going through, come up with intelligent ways to 
retest the card and see if it's going to go through, as opposed to what some people do on a reoccurring basis, is they just try every single day until uh, Adam calls you up and says you're being shut down. So you know you want to make a, an intelligent decision when 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 attempting that card for card you know funds you know lack of funds. Um, obviously, if it comes back as the card has been lost or stolen and the card number is no good, there's no reason to keep dinging that card. Um, but knowing your consumer and, and doing proper advertising to make sure you get all those payments in is definitely helpful. So I just want to build on that a little. So just so I understand, you have a hearing aid that's $500, and for easy math, you're going to break that up into five payments of $100. Simple, all right? So th there's also, aside from you know ensuring that you know, let's say that last payment of $100 declines, right? So, you know, there are gateways out there that can then retry for lower mark amounts, and you can actually set those parameters prior to. So if it declines for 100, let's try to run it for 80, right? So you're still getting 80 versus walking away from the whole payment. The other thing that you need to consider when applying for a merchant account is understanding the contingent liability on that, right? So if you sold it, you know, on September 1st for $500, your contingent liability goes for six months, right? So the consumer could charge it back for six months. You're breaking that payment up, in my example, for five months. You're adding an additional five months. So now you've got 11 months of contingent liability, right? Because they can dispute that transaction from the date of the last payment for the entire amount of the transaction. So you're going to have a lot of underwriters that are going to see your billing model and you know, they may approve it, they may then start seeing, you know, an average ticket that was lifted of $500 that's being broken up into 100. So you just really need to make sure that the acquirer, the you know, the ISO, the processor you're dealing with, fully understands that because most banks, most acquirers, they don't like contingent liability ex ex exceeding six months. Um, so depending on how you're breaking up the payments, it's something that you really need to take into consideration when applying for a merchant account. Thank you. Anybody else? And we will hang around for a moment afterwards, too. Maybe one more uh, did question? Did you have a question? No, no. OK. We have one over here. First off, I'd like to thank you for your time today. So thank you very much for taking your time and educating all of us. Um, reserves have always been a nebulous thing for me. How do you determine the reserves? Obviously, there's many factors, including chargebacks, returns, et cetera. But how do you determine a reserve amount? And why does it always seem to grow as your, uh, even if your sales uh, remain stagnant, why do your reserves tend to grow? So I can say that one of the things that, that merchants, one of the reasons merchants like doing business with us is because we don't institute what's called a rolling reserve, right? So we're not gonna always be holding back 10% of your sales, regardless of how large the, you know, regardless of how, um, how large the reserve account grows. So our standard reserve terms, which we can obviously adjust based on risk, are a 10% hold back to half the approved monthly volume of your merchant account. So for easy numbers, if you get approved for $100,000 a month, we're gonna eventually want $50,000 in the reserve account, and we're gonna want that built up um, by applying a 10% hold back until we hit 50K, right? So one of the reasons merchant accounts with us, for example, would grow is let's say you come in and your $100,000 merchant account now needs to become a $250,000 merchant account because your business has grown. Um, that's one reason. Um, that's really the only reason you would see it with us, unless for some reason we started seeing very fraudulent activity, we realized you were a bad actor, and then they say we're just gonna have a 100% hold because we wanna make sure that we're not gonna take a loss. The, the other thing I really do wanna make sure everyone understands about reserves is that we, and by we I mean the, you know, the ISO that's facing you, the merchant, always looks like the bad guy with reserves. The reserve terms are generally outlined in our credit policy, right? So our, our issuing, or I'm sorry, our acquiring bank, right, our sponsor bank, makes us take these reserves. And sometimes we may not even think that the reserve is appropriate, um, but just based off of your merchant type or your MCC code, we have to do it in order to approve your account. Um, but any legitimate acquirer that you're dealing with should always do a reserve review after six months. You can call my director of risk, and within 72 hours, you will take a look at your account, you will take a look at your processing, and if your processing is clean, nine times out of 10, 
we're going to give you some of that money back. Um, nine times out of 10, you may come in and say, we now need a, you know, a quarter million a month. If your processing is clean on the 100,000, we're gonna give you that $150,000 lift and not do anything with your reserve. So it really is just making sure that you're working with a company that's transparent um, and follows through when they say they're gonna do something. So one other issue with reserves, there's a number that they need, and that number is your chargebacks that you expect during the chargeback liability time of six months. So if you can determine when your data transaction is to the date of your chargeback, and then you can extrapolate that out to the end of the six months for each individual transaction, so take one or two days in time and extrapolate that out to your full six months, you can then know what your reserve really should be. So you may see that your reserve is way lower than it should be, then maybe you don't want to call up Adam's risk department and have a conversation. Um, but chances are you'll see that you are way under-reserved and that they're actually giving you a really fair number. And that's where you've you got to say, well, I, I, I didn't realize the risk that they're actually taking. Because 100% of those chargebacks, if you disappear, for the next six months become Adam's problem, become Lexus's problem. And they don't like to take those losses, and, and they shouldn't have to take those losses for your bad business practices. So it's a very easy number to figure out. Once you can figure out how many days it takes for your average transaction to turn into a chargeback and, and what your chargeback ratio is going to be. Okay, thank you. We are out of time. Adam, Ben, and Alexis, thank you so much. Um, we're around for a little while for questions, and have a great day. Thank you.